It's time for CX Education. Welcome to the podcast for enterprise CX professionals, the people who want to connect with customers on their own terms, before, during, and after a purchase is made. In each episode, you'll learn how to create experiences your customers love. Ready? Here we go. Hi, everyone. I am Heather Garand from Cinch. We have Brian Walker, Chief Strategy Officer for Bloomreach, where we talk today about the customer journey and personalization. Welcome, Brian. Thank you for having me, Heather. My pleasure. Okay, Brian. Thank you so much for joining us on our podcast today. Why don't we start by you giving the audience a little bit about your background and some of your past experiences and what you're up to now at Bloomreach? Well, Heather, thank you so much for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm Brian Walker. I like to introduce myself as a longtime member of the e-commerce and digital marketing community. I have been in many different roles across the industry, really kind of getting started when e-commerce was really just beginning and was a part of a team who launched eddiebauer.com many years ago. Actually, when I joined at the time, it was called Interactive Media. And we really didn't even have a website. We were actually producing CD-ROMs that people would get in the mail, browse through the catalog. And then, of course, that would kick off a file that would head to our call center, which would then enter that order for the customer. And then, of course, we got started really in the early days of the web with with a direct-to-consumer e-commerce business. And... From there, I had many different stops along the way, including stops at Amazon and Expedia. When I left Expedia, I did a startup for a bit and then went to Forrester Research where I took on the commerce technology research for Forrester. Did that for many years. Some may uh, know me from still little thumbnails in the reports that are still out there circulating. Then I, I, I took the step into the software side of the business. And when I left Forrester, I joined Hybris Software, which was a leading e-commerce platform back in the day based out of Munich, Germany, and was really a part of the sort of next wave, the next generation of, of commerce technology. I led strategy for Hybris, and then we were acquired by SAP, where I was for a number of years as we grew the CX and commerce business at, at SAP. So those of you using SAP Commerce out there, um, you know, I had a hand in that as well. And then when I left there, I spent some time at Accenture leading the global commerce offering before getting back into the software side. I've been at Bloomreach now nearly three years, leading strategy here at Bloomreach. Yeah, so that's a little bit about me. Hopefully I didn't drain my CV too much there. Wow, you have such a wealth of experience <laughs> and you've been with so many different companies doing so yes. many great things. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about Bloomreach and what Bloomreach does. So Bloomreach is uh, the world's leading commerce experience uh, cloud. We provide sort of three key pillars as a part of that cloud offering. It's all composable, all API first, throw a few buzzwords around there. But, you know, customers use different combinations of our solutions together with, with other solutions in the market. And then some customers use the entire cloud together. Those three pillars are all focused on personalization and optimization of the commerce experience. The first pillar I'll talk about is discovery, which is where we power uh, search, merchandising, and product recommendations and personalization on sites. It's all AI-driven uh, solution that really you know optimizes for the key commerce KPIs that businesses are looking to optimize against, and we do that really through a very you know sort of a pragmatic application of AI where we both enrich the product catalog and, and enable like product discovery to really work as effectively as possible. And that's pretty different from how a lot of other search engines work. And we do that in part by listening to customer behavior and how they interact with, with a site. And so there's some, some really interesting capabilities there. The second pillar is content, and it kind of speaks for itself. It's it's the experiences that we as consumers or B two B buyers, you know, are interacting with. We we power the, the 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 sites and applications of customers with the content solution, and again, are doing targeting and personalization through that product as well. And then the last is engagement, which is of course where we also partner with Cinch. And engagement is is a AI driven 
engagement solution focused on marketing automation, channel optimization, and, and, and you know, marketing optimization, again, focused on personalizing the channels, the content, uh, and the marketing that a customer receives through email, through text, through in-app notifications, social, and advertising. So those three products come together to form the Commerce Experience Cloud. And it's a very differentiated solution in the market um, since we kind of are unique in our ability to drive that end-to-end customer experience, making it both consistent uh, and, and personalized. I was in a call with one of your colleagues yesterday uh, talking quite a bit about the relationship between uh, Cinch and Bloomreach and all the great things that you guys are doing. And it'll be really exciting to see to see it come to life together. You Indeed. ready for me? Indeed. Okay, so let's jump right into this and talk about the digital first mindset. As we like to think, and we kind of are coming out of COVID, the last two years have changed dramatically, and we're really seeing a, a massive shift in the way that we're all interacting with digital. I mean, we, the way that we are communicating with our friends, family, and at work. And this has absolutely changed the way that people shop. So based on your experiences and the conversations you're having, what are retailers talking about and what are the biggest struggles that they're seeing today? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I wouldn't, I wouldn't only make that um, kind of a focus on, on retail because I think it really applies to really every business out there. You know, digital, when it was first kind of coming to the fore, you know, now many decades ago, I guess I could say. And then, of course, as it's matured in the more recent past to become such a critical part of the business for omni-channel businesses who are operating traditional stores or branches or who have other sort of you know, long-standing channels that they engage in and sell to customers. Digital was sort of grew up as, you know, an important piece but not necessarily the prime driver. And, and in fact, e-commerce really sort of, sort of started as an order entry vehicle, not unlike the story I told with kind of how I got my start um, in the business. And of course, the trends that, that we now see really playing out in a, in a more important way were already happening pre-pandemic. The pandemic just, of course, dramatically accelerated the importance of digital as a way to engage with, inspire, and convert customers. And obviously there was a point in time during the pandemic where it was essentially the only channel, right? And businesses that really hadn't uh, focused on, on digital, of course, had to accelerate you know, the, the way they were leveraging those channels dramatically. And then also, link together their channels more effectively. So an example would be curbside pickup, uh, for example, which had a pretty dramatic impact in the pandemic, both on, you know, the consumer and the consumer behavior, but also how businesses, you know, thought about how their channels needed to interact together. And of course, we saw the dramatic growth in home improvement, uh, home furnishings, grocery, categories that were kind of lagging in terms of e-commerce penetration actually do very, very well through the pandemic, dramatic growth in those market segments. And things like curbside pickup played a critical role, right? It wasn't just direct to consumer fulfillment that was, that was satisfying the demand. And for the consumer, it also became very convenient <laughs> to, 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 to shop that way. I know that for myself, Home improvement, for example, you know, if I need things for the garden or the house or what have you, you know, frankly, I find curbside pickup still just exceptionally convenient relative to hunting and pecking through a store, right? So doing your research online, you know, and then and then shopping and converting online, but the the, the fulfillment of that order is going to happen at the at the store, you know, when I when I pull up. And during the pandemic, that was really critical. And now post-pandemic, it's convenient, right? And so that's just a, an example. But I think to your, to your question, still there's many organizations out there that aren't really transitioning their business processes and the way they think about their customer experience to really a digital first strategy. And, and the implications of that are pretty profound. It's not just your marketing. It's not just how you think about your, 
you know, your e-commerce or digital storefront and so forth and your apps, you know, it, it, delivering on your, you know, sort of brand vision and the lifestyle and all these things that you want to project. But it's also your product sourcing. It's, it's your uh, way in which you think about your business processes now needing to transition to digital first strategy. And so rather I use the analogy of a train, you know, digital was sort of the caboose. The train now needs to run the other way and, and digital has to be the engine and the other channels are still really important. In fact, I think there's kind of an old adage that channels don't really die. Um, you know, yeah. in B2B faxes are still a thing, believe it or not. Yeah. So even that <laughs> channels <laughs> hasn't really died, but, but, but the digital, uh, first strategy, you know, really respects the fact that that a consumer now is being inspired, they're discovering products, they're responding through digital channels, primarily, and the other channels now need to complement it versus everything being store focused, for example. Interesting. I am absolutely going to steal your analogy. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> so I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's an original analogy by me either. So I think it's open source. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sounds good to me. So based on that, what does this mean for uh, acquiring new customers? And how does the digital experience that you offer impact the relationships built? Yeah, I think it's we're really also going through a very fundamental shift in marketing strategies. And I think the pandemic also contributed to that in addition to changes in data privacy protection and, you know, deprecation of third party cookies and, you know, app opt ins and all these changes that are that are being driven by uh, the big platform providers like Apple and Google and so forth, as well as regulations like GDPR and CCPA and so forth. But during the pandemic, every digital business was growing. You know, everyone was kind of responding to this shift in demand. Now we see that customer acquisition has become a lot more expensive, number one, and number two, a lot less effective. And there's really been a, a pretty profound shift kind of over the last few years, a combination of those factors kind of propelling it, a shift toward really a more sustainable marketing model, which is focused on the customer relationship. And some would call that retention marketing uh, or customer relationship marketing, which is really about personalization and, you know, using right channel, right offer and engaging with the customer in order to, from a marketing perspective, you know, keep your, your file healthy and reactivate those customers. And, you know, retail math would show pretty quickly that, you know, if you're able to, to do that effectively, you know, your marketing costs, your customer lifetime value and, and, and the costs associated with, with marketing to your customers will be a lot healthier as well. And it's a lot more sustainable, you know, pre pandemic kind of in a little different, you know, period customer acquisition costs were actually pretty moderate in, in terms of the digital channels and retargeting was like an effective, somewhat effective strategy. Although I think now we realize that maybe it was more flawed than many marketers believed. And so this, there has been, been this profound shift. Now, I think it's important to recognize that for established businesses with, you know, kind of a, you know, a substantial number of customers and so forth, that pivot makes sense. Um, and it doesn't mean that you're going to limit your customer acquisition, you know, dramatically. It's still important, but the emphasis and the focus and the investments are going now more into, you know, leveraging your customer data more effectively, personalizing and activating those customers that you've already, you know, acquired more effectively, right? And and marketing to them more effectively as a result of that. Customer acquisition, obviously, if you're a smaller business, if you're a younger brand or what have you, it's become really challenging now to, to see the same kind of results from customer acquisition spend because the costs have gone up dramatically and the effectiveness of those strategies has also changed. And so we're really in an interesting point in time where where that you know many marketers are still adjusting, I would say, to, to that profound shift. Bloomreach, we're very much focused on enabling our customers to optimize the experience and optimize the marketing and the marketing channels 
that they're using to reach their existing customers. So, you know, there's certainly ways in which we support customer acquisition and, and, you know, targeting customers effectively through those acquisition channels, leveraging our platform. But really our focus is in ensuring that our clients are maximizing, you know, the, the customers that they've already acquired and serving them in a more effective way through really all of their channels. Let's talk about that for a second. What type of data and information can you pull into your platform? Well, Bloomreach is kind of unique in that we both have a very robust customer data platform, but also we have this very uh, rich set of product data that I mentioned earlier. So we're kind of unique and that's what gives us a leg up when it comes to driving personalization because we really believe it's the combination of those things where um, you're able to more effectively you know, personalize the experiences you're delivering to customers. So to answer your question on the pro customer data side, right, it's almost every event and every interaction you have with a customer through your digital channels that we're able to pull into the platform and then, you know, use that to create the so-called single view of customer. Everything orients around the customer, you know, and we create a very rich set of attribution and data and we're able to do processing on that data to even enrich it further. Some of it can be what we would call zero party data. This is data that the customer is actually very willing to provide. You know, if you're if you're doing things like surveys or you're asking customers kind of explicitly to respond and, and indicate interests and so forth, right? That's that's zero party data. And that's actually a very like important component to personalization, right? It's not just always inferring the customer's interests, you can also ask them, <laughs> right? Yep. But obviously there's a huge amount of data to also be gained through like the, all those implicit signals and the ways customers are interacting, time of day, channel, offer, and then how they're navigating in, in, in browsing and shopping your sites and apps, of course, also comes into play. So we bring all that data together to create that single view of customer. And then we pair that with our rich understanding of the products to, to enable that level of personalization. And that plays out across, again, all of your marketing and experience channels. Okay, thank you. So myself coming from a big data, big data background, the question that I have for you that you know is asked of me, when is it too much data? Yeah, I think, you know, it's separating the signal from the noise that's really important, right? And lots of data, major investments in data lakes and so forth over the last number of years. And I think those were, in some cases, really important steps for businesses to take. Bloomreach, we actually integrate to those big data lakes and so forth. But what we're really focused on is the data that's that's actually important for you to serve and market to your customer more effectively. And we do a lot of processing on that data, right? Um, in order in order to do that. So data in and of itself, you know, there is the analogy that that you know data is the new oil, right? And many of many listeners have probably heard that term. And I think it actually is a good analogy, but it doesn't stop with that, you know, the oil that comes out of the ground, although thankfully we're, you know, making progress at more sustainable uh, energy sources, but just to use that analogy, right, the oil that comes out of the ground, there's not much you can do with it without actually processing it into useful fuel or products that, you know, perhaps unfortunately we now have incorporated so much throughout our economy. But as an analogy, it's a good one. And it's similar to data in the sense that the data in and of itself is not going to be particularly useful unless you can do processing and understanding and using AI and ML to do that at scale and to do it very quickly. And, you know, there's lots of businesses out there that have a wealth of data but aren't actually able to activate it or use it. And that's true as well for customers that have invested in things like customer data platforms, more at a kind of a data infrastructure level. And then activating on it still remains very difficult for many businesses out there. And that's another key point that at Bloomreach we're very focused on is that our applications that sit on top of our data platforms enable you know, to, 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 you know, 
have an impact with it, right? To activate that data and make it meaningful and useful. Yeah, exactly. Thank you for that. <clears throat> okay, so you've talked a lot about this personalization, and I talk a lot about this in my day to day as well, knowing that, you know, one of the stats that I love is 80% of consumers will respond or buy once they receive a personalized message. So my question to you is, when you get asked, how do I make this experience personalized? How do you answer that? You have all this data, you have this wonderful platform. So now how do I bring it down to the most human level and make it personalized and I feel like one-to-one? -one? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's really about, you know, kind of a classic, you know, first principle, right? When, when you walk into a store, for example, and that shopkeeper is someone that you know, who knows you, maybe they even know your family, you know, and they're able to not only make that experience pretty efficient for you because they already know what you want, but also are going to make smart recommendations about something that you may also be interested in. You know, I collect Amaro's and vermouths because I'm kind of an amateur uh, mixologist, right? And yeah, I do go frequent a couple of stores. Actually, one's in Los Angeles because I'm down there pretty frequently visiting family and so forth. And they have an amazing selection. I've actually gotten to know them. And when I walk in there, they're That's like, great. hey, we have some new stuff, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you might want to check out and they'll describe it for me or here in Seattle where I live similarly. Right. And that's just an example of like a first principle, you know, that has nothing to do with digital. Right. But unfortunately, in our sort of mass marketing kind of world that that, you know, you know, we have in a sense transitioned into over the last 50 to 100 years in our economy, you know, it became very difficult to really serve the customer effectively in that same kind of personalized way. And through the transition to digital, now we really do have an opportunity to kind of go back to some of those first principles. So of mm -hmm. course, it's understanding everything from the best time of day to deliver a message to the right channel to deliver it in to the content of that message and respect what the customer has already shared with you, like the zero party data I was speaking about earlier, or make really smart, you know, recommendations and, and offers and so forth based on what you know about the customer. At the same time, make their experience more efficient at the same time. A lot of replenishables, consumables, and in, this is certainly true in B2B as well, it's as much about efficiency as it is about, you know, trying to upsell or cross sell mm -hmm. a customer. And I think it's important to think of it that way too, because personalization can sound like we're leveraging data and we're being kind of creepy and we're trying to kind of hide in the shadows and, and somehow trick, you know, play a trick. That's not really, you know, at the core of it, right? If we really think about it as delivering a better service to the customer, making their experience efficient, making it relevant, making it contextual. And in some cases, you know, my shopping journey may be quite different from what I was doing before. Maybe in this shopping journey, I'm shopping for a gift or an occasion or something like that. Well, we can do a lot of inference by listening to and watching the, the customer and how they're navigating. Not that we're spying on anyone, but, you know, we're, we're watching the data and the system is, is engineered to adapt to that mm -hmm. signal. Um, but we can also ask the customer as well. And that's even a more powerful signal, right? Yeah. So um, just to kind of base it in first principles, right? It comes down to pretty simple ideas that do require data. They do require AI and ML. And so to some degree, you know, people, merchants and marketers also playing a role in curating experiences and helping the customer as well. And those two things should work together, right? And, you know, we certainly see our solutions as complementing merchants and marketers and helping them do more at scale and serve the customer more effectively, not replace them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So this brings me to my next question for you. And maybe you can expand on this because you're touched on it right at the very end. How do you bring this personalization to scale? 
Yeah, well, again, I think you have to use uh, AI and ML. There's only so many customer journeys or customer segments and targets that you can establish in your experience, especially if you're serving like a large volume of customers, you know, there's only so much you can do. You know, I, I used to work for a very, very good direct marketer who used to say there's really only a maximum of eight segments we can really focus on and optimize, mm -hmm. which I thought was really interesting. Now, I'm not suggesting that it is actually eight, but <laughs> this was yeah. a very, very, very strong marketer. And she was very committed to that idea because, you know, at the time we were reading reports and making decisions in it, right? Now, of course, we can leverage platforms like Bloomreach to automate a lot of that process and get down into micro segments that, you know, really are tuned to certain customer cohorts. And then we're using one-to-one -one personalization to complement that. So at scale, you really need a solution that's able to do those kinds of things. You as a merchant or a marketer may still have like thematic things you're trying to do uh, that are conveying your brand and your product story and so forth. And, and you're, again, curating the experience in a sense for the customer. But in order to really be effective at scale, there's you really have to use the power of the data, but then also look to, to deliver kind of optimization on top of that. And it really does come down to kind of a pragmatic application of, of AI. And I think that's kind of important. You know, AI kind of carries a bit of a mysterious quality to it out there. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be thought that way, thought about mm -hmm. that way. There are certainly businesses out there who have data scientists and they're using those big data lakes and they're trying to create understanding and they're trying to drive ways to optimize, but leveraging a pragmatic API, excuse me, AI capability like Bloomreach is it's very much tuned to optimizing the experience and driving those key business KPIs, including customer lifetime value, conversion rate, average order size, et cetera. Okay. So not to name names here, but could you describe some of the business impacts these solutions have? Yeah, I think, you know, it's, you know, in our day and age, right, everyone's still really searching for growth. And we've seen, you know, e-commerce traffic now kind of start to level off post-pandemic. Like we're not seeing these massive spikes in online traffic. But most e-commerce businesses out there are probably still looking at, at, at a 25 to 30 percent growth goal, right, coming out of the pandemic. That's a pretty big number. And so, you know, when we talk to customers, for example, about how our different solutions can impact their business, sometimes they're a little surprised because they can have a pretty massive impact. So just for example, you know, optimizing search, for example, in a grocery segment, we can have a 20 to 25 percent impact on revenue uh, per visitor. That's wow. pretty dramatic. Yeah. If you start taking the the customer segmentation and, you know, the CDP capabilities and our engagement capabilities and you bring those together with product discovery, we can drive another 9%, 8 to 9% improvement in wow. in in revenue per visitor. Those are big numbers. And certainly when you look at just even engagement, right? Pretty dramatic improvement in things like customer lifetime value, right? Seven to 10% improvements in customer mm -hmm. lifetime value is massive. Again, if you're thinking about, I already acquired these customers. Now I need to get more out of this file that I managed to, to accumulate, right? Through various different acquisition channels and so forth. And I can get 10%, excuse me, 10% improvement on that by implementing yeah. something like personalized channel optimized marketing. That's dramatic, right? Yeah. So these are really meaningful business impacts that, 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 you know, solutions like Bloomreach can really have on a business when you're, when you're leveraging the data and you're, you're leveraging the optimizations that you can, you can derive and deliver on top of that. Yep, I think we are living in some very exciting times with everything that we can do as marketers for sure. All right. Thanks, Brian, for all the great insights today. Before we go, what I'm hoping you can do as we wrap up is give three pieces of advice to brands as they're reimagining their customer journey in this omnichannel world. 
Well, I think the first one goes back to a question you asked earlier, right? Which is this idea of digital first. I think you've really got to think about the impact that your digital channels are having across the entire business, not just counting the revenues that you're getting through your your websites, your apps, and and, and other digital channels, right? So I think first and foremost, it's it's really thinking thoughtfully about that and understanding what the customer is doing, you know, and, and the impact that your digital channels are having on, on how they're engaging with your brand, with engaging with your products, deciding, you know, doing their research. And if they do convert, you know, they may or may not convert in your online channel. And so a lot of e-commerce businesses have really been very focused on, you know, the revenues and conversion rates and so forth. And that's for a good reason, but it's kind of, then ends up being in a silo, right? Mm -hmm. Still again. So I think first and foremost, working with the rest of your organization to really think digital first. And then, as I said earlier, sometimes that may have some impact even on your business processes and how you think about everything from your merchandising strategies to customer support strategies, et cetera, as well. So I think that's number one. Number two, more short-term, more pragmatic is test, test, test. You know, the, the tools that we have today enable that uh, and enable it at scale. But many marketers um, are not really doing very effective testing. Mm. And they're not doing a lot of testing against segments and targets. And so they're not learning and they're not learning very fast. Uh, they're still in kind of a batch and blast kind of mindset dating back to the early days of direct marketing when that was kind of the only way to do things. But But certainly we're... 25, 30 years into digital now, and we have tools that enable that. And I would say test, test, test. And so a culture of testing, um, understanding that the customer is always smarter than we are, right? And they're going to respond to things in ways that you may not quite predict. And the only way to really um, uncover that is testing. And then the third is maybe medium term. It's really having a a clear sort of data strategy for your business and and really making the investments in understanding your customers more effectively and being able to target and personalize off of that. Many businesses have made investments that they're not actually realizing the full benefit from. In some cases, that may lead to a trough of disillusionment, right, to to use the Gartner term. But, But... it's, it's a journey that they need to stay on. They need to stay focused on. And then for those businesses that haven't really made effective investments yet, it's critical that they, they, they think through what they need to do as a business to, to, to leverage the data, to improve the way they're able to serve customers as a result of that. Again, leveraging ways to activate that and optimize all their different ways they're interacting with customers. Okay. I, I, I think, I think we caught all that. I was having some internet issues, like my volume, my, I was skipping, but I think that we're, I think that we caught that. Okay. You heard it all. Okay. Perfect. 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 Okay. So we'll wrap up now. Again, Brian, thank you so much for being on Brian. What's your title again? Chief strategy officer. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I should have your bio up in front of me because I am going to need to record the intro here. <clears throat> it was wonderful to have you on today, Brian, the Chief Strategy Officer for Bloomreach. And I hope that you do come back to our podcast again and we can continue this conversation. I would love to, Heather. Thank you so much for having me on. Maybe I come back to share some of the primary research we're doing through Comex together and and maybe talk about, you know, how things continue to evolve in the market. That sounds great. I look forward to that chat. Wonderful. Thank you. That's it for this episode of CX Education. Thanks for joining us. This show is brought to you by Cinch, the technology company that helps you create mobile experiences your customers love. Did you enjoy the episode? Then make sure to subscribe to CX Education wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts or visit cinch.com slash podcast to get instant access to all the latest episodes.